semi-final of the World University Debating Championships 2012. My name is Tim Mooney, I'll be chairing this adjudication panel. I'm joined by Cormac Early, Shamila Parmanand, Kamira Chetty, Adam Goldstein, Saikid Islam and Sean Risco on the panel. And in the debate we have in the opening government, Monash B. In opening opposition, Oxford A. Closing government, Stanford A. Yeah. And in closing opposition, Oxford C. Yeah. Without any further ado, I'll call this house to order and call upon the Prime Minister, Kieran, to begin this debate. without parental consent. And number three, there are better ways to regulate the status quo than exists currently. And that's our model. What are the kind of images that we're going to regulate differently? We're going to include in our definition all pornography. So all depictions of sex, all men, men's magazines, ladies and gentlemen, any form of advertising which relies on the sexualization of women. And, and of men. <laughs> and, and we're more than willing to entertain a debate about uh, images of Victor dancing seductively on the dance floor, but that kind of sexual image. We believe all of these things should be confined, ladies and gentlemen, both to adult stores and to XXX sites. To get the XXX classification, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that websites will have to register and meet particular standards. If those standards are not met, those websites will be shut down. Moreover, any website which tries to display sexual imagery without meeting this, these state standards, without having this XXX classification, will be shut down under our model. We think it's a hell of a lot easier to do that once you have a clear uh, uh, differentiation between these different types of websites. Moreover, we believe that for people to access any of these images, they have to prove that they're over 18. We think that's pretty easy in the context both of an adult store and an XXX domain. And if these websites particularly fail to check, we will shut them down, ladies and gentlemen. Those mechanisms are much easier on our side. Two key arguments at Prime Minister. Number one, sexual imagery is different from other speech and should be regulated differently. Secondly, why our plan makes it easier to regulate some of the worst harms that occur under status quo. So first, sexual imagery is different from other speech. Why is rape punished differently, ladies and gentlemen, to any other violent crime? Because we believe that sex is different, and sex has consequences which are often so much more significant than other forms of speech. I'll take you. Uh, does this also apply to like, film, television, books, and so on? Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that any situation in which a particular manufacturer is seeking to produce something which desires the sexualization of a particular uh, person, ladies and gentlemen, that should be included within the model. So we do believe that if a particular film contains, contains this kind of image, we're happy to include that because the harms are so significant if we do not. So why should sex be treated differently? We believe, ladies and gentlemen, sexual images have a unique potential to cause harm that many other forms of speech do not. Why is that? Number one, sexual images are often incredibly offensive to people, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not some, if you're someone who believes that sex is deeply personal, who's disgusted by the idea of women, uh, you know, prostrating their bodies on the cover of a men's magazine, ladies and gentlemen, it should be your choice whether you access that. Yet under the status quo, when you can buy a Playboy at the 7-Eleven, ladies and gentlemen, people who opt out of this kind of speech are still exposed to that. And ultimately, we're not saying those people are right or wrong to believe these characterizations are offensive, but moreover, that the state should strike a balance Sir. that reflects their capacity to opt out from seeing this type of speech. Moreover, Sir. the second key reason why sexual imagery should be treated differently is because it affects attitudes so much more perniciously. We say, ladies and gentlemen, the way you view an other gender is often highly constructed by the kind of sexual imagery that's propagated in the mass media. 
So it's not just porn, ladies and gentlemen. It's men's magazines, which paint women as temptresses, which paint women as being up for it at all times. Sir. Even advertising, ladies and gentlemen, for women selling shoes, which paint them as basically trying to prostitute themselves out to sell that item of clothing. What that means is that that particular product loses all relevance, and the entire message is about the sexualization of that woman. That's how these images are so persuasive. Sir. What does that do? It constructs norms about how you see women, ladies and gentlemen, as a sexual object, as an object that doesn't mean value the same thing. Moreover, it promotes particular body norms that are really harmful. When young girls in particular see depictions, say, in Playboy, of what the archetypal attractive body is, blonde hair and big boobs, ladies and gentlemen, that's extremely harmful to their identity. Because often they haven't developed the self-identity, the self-confidence to recognize how unrealistic these particular images is. So that can be corrosive, ladies and gentlemen. You know, promote eating disorders when you believe that this kind of sexualized image is what you aspire to, and if you don't meet that goal, you're not hot, you're not attractive, men won't want you. Those are the kind of images that have pervade through the plan. No, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Moreover, we believe that sexual imagery has the potential to flow into your own life. Because everyone has the capacity to have sex, ladies and gentlemen. The norms that are constructed through pornography in terms of how to treat women, in terms of what women want, ladies and gentlemen, can be embodied in your own life. That power to construct norms is often really harmful. Furthermore, so, this is particularly the case for children, ladies and gentlemen. We see on the status quo when sexual images are so easy to acquire, that's incredibly harmful. Children often don't have the cognitive capacity to recognize that a fantasy scene in a porno, ladies and gentlemen, is unreal. It doesn't actually reflect the reality of sex. But these images have the power to pervade the way these people actually see things and construct their norms. So, so recognizing all of the potential harms of this sexual imagery, how should the state approach this? We believe that sexual imagery has the highest probability of harm of speech and should be treated differently. However, we still respect the choice to access. We believe, ultimately, sex is a deeply personal thing. We recognize that watching, for example, pornography in some circumstances can lead to pleasure. However, ladies and gentlemen, the state needs to, the state needs to reflect a balance, ladies and gentlemen, which, which ensures that those who opt out, those whose image is harmed through allowing this material, actually get protected. So those bar barriers, ladies and gentlemen, involve imposing a cost on people who want to access this kind of material, which may mean having to pay Sorry. something at the adult store, which may mean having to go to an XSX domain, which is potentially harder to access, reflecting the harmful externalities to society that occur through the existence of this speech that's unregulated. Secondly, our plan makes it easier to regulate the worst harms, ladies and gentlemen. So what actually happens to our plan? When you have combined all sexual imagery to adult stores and XXX portals, there's a limited pool of places to look. So the state is trying to enforce regulations about what's acceptable and what isn't. They can go directly to these domains, ladies and gentlemen, and shut down everything outside these domains. That's much easier. What are the benefits of this? It's easier for the state to control illegal practices. So when the state can, the state can find it easy to enforce the use of condoms in porn, the state can ban the use of rape scenes, ladies and gentlemen. So once you control the amount of material that is available, it's easier for the state to look at that material and to prescribe particular practices within that. Moreover, it's easier to control things like child porn, ladies and gentlemen, once you can find the number of sites which actually have the capacity to offer this material and will enforce regulations to ensure that that kind of prescribed material doesn't exist. Moreover, it's easier to stop kids accessing this when you have to go to an adult store to buy this material. So ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that at times sexual imagery can be titillating, can be pleasurable, can be fun. But for those who opt out, for those who are vulnerable, it imposes major externalities. That's why we should limit access to the most restricted domains. sex is only dirty if it's done right. On opposition today, we're instead going to contend that sex can only be done right when it isn't made dirty by society, when it isn't pushed to the margins, and ultimately we can never transform the potentially harmful norms of sexuality if they exist today. Two points of opening opposition. Firstly, the importance of sex in the public sphere, why it's important for people 
between being able to engage with their sexuality through images in public. Secondly, when they set back transformative and minority sexualities. Before that, four points of rebuttal. Firstly, Kieran tells you sex is deeply personal, therefore you have a right not to be offended by seeing it in public. We think that is false. Many people are deeply offended by certain things that they have to see in the social world that is a consequence of living in a social world. Racists are uncomfortable watching interracial couples walk down the street holding hands. That doesn't mean they don't have a right to see them. Even if they did, Kieran said, we have to strike a balance between people's ability to opt out of seeing these images. Good, then allow people to have to see them in a news agent in passing and not buy them and consume them. That's the status quo. Secondly, he says, this is harmful to the way you view other genders. First point on this, people can still watch that pornography under their model. The problem with their model is that, as I'm going to show you in my substantive material, it prevents us from transforming the way that sex is consumed by women, by minorities, within society. Thirdly, he gives you all of this stuff about why ultimately we respect choice, but we think it needs to be constrained because of the social harms. Like, we're just going to contest all of their social harms. Finally, he brings you this stuff about regulation. To be very clear, it's not like child porn sites at the moment aren't trying to stay off the radar of the regulatory authorities, ladies and gentlemen. There was no explanation as to why now, because like, the regulators can go, oh, dot XXX, that's legit. Like, illegitimate sites aren't going to try and hide themselves. They still have to use exactly the same technology as they have under the status quo to find this stuff. So that falls. No. First, why is sex so important to the public sphere? The first thing we want to contend on of is that there is an arbitrary line which exists, like in some people's minds, including seemingly the minds of open government, between sex and other forms of emotions. We contend that that line is arbitrary, that it is a relic of certain societies trying to make sex dirty. We don't think that's something that we should be stood up for. Why is that? Because ultimately, for many people, for the vast majority of people in society, some form of sexuality will form a vital part of their lived experience. We need to, and those people need to be able to engage with that in public. By the way, their policy requires an incredibly conservative form of line drawing under these things. Because anything that can even conceivably be slightly sexually attractive to somebody, like a magazine cover with a picture of somebody hot, potentially has to be outlawed under their model. Why does this policy shame people? stop them engaging with it in public. Well, firstly, because now having an interest in sex is something that requires you to go to something that the state has labelled and society has labelled dirty and wrong. In order to have any access to like alternative interesting forms of sexuality, you have to go and sit in a weird adult shop with a fat old guy who's touching himself inappropriately. <laughs> Secondly, because under their model, they tell people that all sex is to be pushed to the margins, that the weirdest forms potentially most harmful forms of sexuality are equivalent to any form of sexuality in the sense that they must all be consumed in the same way. And thirdly, because there's now less public discourse about sexuality under their model. I'll take Kieran in one second. Why are images so important to that? Because often in order to start a conversation about sexuality, about what people find attractive or interesting, they need an image to pique their interest, to give them a moment of like a certain type of reaction that allows them to then create a conversation about those things. We think that's particularly damaging for women, where the best way to transform women's oppression by sexuality is to make them active consumers of sex. This is a policy which stops them doing that, because women now like can't objectify men on magazine covers. We think it would be potentially very positive if they were able to do so to become consumers of sex. Kieran. Ben, do you support people having sex in public? <laughs> I... <laughs> If it is ultimately shown to be consistent with our principles, we will uh. say yes. <laughs> Nonetheless, we say there may be overriding problems. Why, very briefly, are images so important to this goal? Firstly, because sex is visual, it is physical. It is not something that can merely be described in words, particularly when, because of the historical repression of sex, there is a poverty of language which people are able to describe sex with and so communicate to each other about sex with. No. Secondly, transformative and minority sexualities. The first thing we want to say is that images can often be very useful at challenging conventional conceptions of what is considered attractive. Look at the recent inclusion of a man on FHM's list of 100 sexiest women. The reason that was so effective 
because a number of men saw the image of that male model, looked at it, found it hot, were attracted by it, and then had to think, actually, maybe my very staged heterosexual conception of sexuality is wrong and ought to be contested. Secondly, because under their model, you don't get public discourse, you don't get culture and media discussing what is right and wrong in sex. You don't get shows like Mad Men, who are able to depict people, like potentially attractive people, being oppressed by their sexuality. So you don't get those potentially upsetting scenes in the office in Mad Men, which ultimately force people to reflect on whether or not like, we ought to change our views about sexual harassment, or the ways that women are treated by sex. No. Thirdly, because for particularly repressed people, people who may be interested in alternative sexualities, particularly homosexuality, though potentially many others, it may be necessary to see an image in order to have a moment of attraction that makes you challenge the sexuality that your society has told you is correct. We think the gay kid in Iowa who no longer is able to see a picture of two men kissing and find that attractive may never find out, or will certainly find it much more difficult to find out that they may be attracted to other men. That's incredibly damaging because ultimately it forces people to live in sexualities which are not their own. Finally on this point, what we tell you is that sex is not simply something that can like, be given technical descriptions of. People may need to like get a sense of what something is actually like physically, and that in turn requires them to be able to get a sense of what it is like visually, and just know that they find it attractive, in order to experiment with their sexuality, and thereby to be able to have better sex. So, what have we brought you an opening opposition? We think ultimately, sex is a vital part of people's lived experience. We think it is better on our side of the house. We also think that the people who they claim are benefited by their policy are less oppressed. We are supremely proud to oppose. Under our model, all of those freedoms are saved. But 
many people in, this, in society right now who are offended by depictions of sex will not be under our model. Many people who are made uncomfortable, and that is not an illegitimate experience, but one that we can protect them from, will be, have that discomfort diminished. And importantly, many people whose attitudes are suddenly shaped, not by the purchase of the Playboy, but by the existence of the Playboy everywhere they go so they know that's how they have to look, will be having that influence on their attitudes and the pressure on their lives diminished. We think that's important. Further on this point of openness, what we heard from Oxford was minorities in particular need the accidental depiction of sex in their lives. Number one, if you are gay, you can see a man and realise you are attracted to him without having to see him naked or engage in sex with another man. But number two, I think there are significant risks with hoping that young gay boys see pornography and learn from that how their bodies should look and how sex should look. Sorry if that got too personal. <laughs> Second point of rebuttal, the importance of images. We think that you can access the images that Ben was talking about under our model. So if you want to use them as a prop for discussion, if you want to use them as a prop to consider your own sexuality, you absolutely will. Because when you walk into our adult stores, which are created under our model, which will actually be adult stores, not porn stores, they will just be stores for adults because you can buy everything there. Porn and Mad Men and any film that contains nipple in it will all be in the one place, right? When you go there, then you can have those same experiences where maybe you consider those other alternatives. But we'd much rather guarantee that people are looking for something with nudity when they find that. We'd much rather guarantee that people are willing to accept some sex coming into their face when they <laughs> We think, we think that the harms that Oxford pointed out was you need to see an image to trigger certain discussions. What that presumes is you need to see sex without your consent in order to change who you are. They hope for the better. Why is an individual not best placed to decide when they are ready to see so, sex? We contend they are. We also think that seeing sexual images without context is particularly harmful. When you're under 18, or when you don't have yet an idea of what that sex is or isn't, whether it is a fantasy, whether it is realistic, that causes significant harm. So, we think the harms of the status quo are two things. Non-consenting access and a lack of regulatory capacity. On regulatory capacity, what we heard was a terrible response. They said, well, there's no way to regulate this better. Every bit of porn on the internet that does not, under our model, have a .xxx suffix will be destroyed. How is that not much easier to control all potential negative types of porn? How is that not much easier to regulate? I'm not saying we're getting rid of all child porn. I'm saying we're reducing the demand, which reduces the market, which is a much better thing than the status quo. That is an important thing in this debate. You cannot brush away. So, Do you not think that if they're willing to ignore the laws about not having children in their porn films, they might also ignore your law about making sure they have a triple X domain? No, it's so true. It's about being much easier to find them because all you have to do is Google image search sex and anything that doesn't have .xxx at the end, you can delete. No, thank you. To my substantive, sexual liberation. It is counterintuitive in this debate, but our model is actually the one that leads to greater sexual liberation, but only when people are ready. Under our model, adult stores actually become stores for adults, not filthy, scungy, cum-encrusted porn hunts. Why is that important? Because right now, right okay. now, if you enter an adult store, you are only going for porn. That stops people from going there. That stops exactly the kind of people who the opposition want to benefit through the subtle benefits of sexual liberation. That stops all the consenting adults who might actually want to because they think someone else will look at them as they enter that store. What happens under our model? You put a curtain down the middle. You have two levels. There is the sexiest sexy part of it, and then there is the everything else sexy part of it. The mad men part, and the like porn part. Why is that a good thing? It means over time, the stigma of entering the store will have to be reduced, unless it is the contention of the opposition that people will stop consuming any culture, which assumes they don't want to do so right now, and they are being forced to watch this, right? If they want to see mad men, lots of people will enter the store with mad men in it. That reduces the stigma of entering that store, and it is a much narrower trip across the aisle than it is to enter that store in the first place. If they believe that porn and information are so important to liberation, then we think you're more likely to get that accidental but consenting exposure under our model. Final point, rape victims. There is a group in this debate who is numerically the smallest but functionally the most affected by even the slightest image of sex because they associate sex with potentially the worst trauma of their life. We think that even though they are a small minority, we should, wherever possible, protect those people from unintended access to sex. Because for some, it is incredibly triggering. It causes massive psychological and physical harms. When you go into a store and see a Playboy, when you are watching a movie and there is accidental sex that you didn't think was going to be in it, that can cause massive damage to rape victims and victims of abuse. It is not saying that we need to shut down all sex. It is saying that we need to control it. 
We think that non-consenting people shouldn't have sex thrust in their face, but if people want it, they're more likely to get it under our model. Don't want to step backwards. 
No. Um, and like, as far as the whole like, oh well, you're more liberated because you just have to step across the aisle to see the to see the porn. No, thank you. In the status quo, you don't even have to go to the sex shop to step across the aisle to see things. You have far more access in like your day-to-day -day television with uh, images, for example, of gay people being attracted to each other. No, thank you. You don't have to seek it out. You, you can like, so you don't have this problem of making the first move. That's always a very difficult one. No, thank you. Finally, as far as children are concerned, not just yet. We aren't convinced that children are better off with that discussion in mainstream culture of sex. A discussion that can't be happen meaningfully unless people have a visceral reaction of attraction and can talk about things in terms that they understand. Moreover, as far as like kids accessing porn goes, I think like under the status quo, most kids aren't allowed, for example, by their parents to access pornography. This still happens in your world. Um, no, thank you. The only difference is you don't have that major counterbalance in mainstream culture. So, first, uh, yeah. Need to see men sexually engaging in order to prompt some people's personal identity. Would you support playing gay porn at Mormon Kids? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe there'd be a backlash or something, but like, potentially, potentially. I don't think we need to like set out our possible, like every response we can have to every possible policy. We're only debating one in particular. I've only got seven minutes. Um, so, art and culture. This isn't a very debating point, admittedly, but I think that under their policy, they do lose a great deal of great art, right? Things like Father Shelley's Venus, I think movies like The Graduate, or like James Bond, again, if you're into that sort of thing. What we tell you is that this is art that has provoked things like meaning, no thank you, salt, like has created solace, and things like this, for millions of people throughout the world, and, that, uh, and throughout history, and that does indeed rely on an ability to inspire attraction in people. We tell you that sex is a big part of life, Right? And it's also a big part of things like fear, insecurity. It's probably the biggest cause of things like suicide. Probably, Mr. Speaker, the biggest cause of like most people's, of like most poems, most happiness, blah, blah, blah. But what we tell you is that what art allows you to do is make sense of, the, of these sorts of impulses. To make them meaningful to yourself by looking at the, how other people have made it meaningful to themselves. And just to see that other people have gone through this. Why do you need to be able to images that inspire attraction in order to do this? Very simply to make it real, to make you un to make you understand in particular the like aspect of lust and of attractiveness that is crucial to this. Finally, those involved in the and the visceral reaction that that inspires draws you into the art. Finally, the uh, question of those involved in production. What we tell you very simply here is that people involved in the creation of like pornography or whatever it is are made um, are, or, or like all kinds of it, like attractiveness art are made worse off when all art is put into the same category of being seedy and of being beyond the pale. Because these firms no longer see it as in their PR interest to make themselves look respectable. Because the state has already said that they can never be respectable. So we don't see them trying to move into the mainstream. We don't see them trying to paint themselves as like any other like acting firm or whatever. And we don't see the like uh, the result the improvements in workers' rights that result from that. So for a very wide range of reasons, I'm supremely proud to oppose. Yeah.